So welcome to uh, the beginning of our God and Country class, the eight-week course. We're learning about America's godly heritage, good economics, and the proper role of government. Our motto, snacks, friends, and saving our country. So we've already had the snacks, we've got the friends, now we're going to embark upon saving our country. I want to start off by telling you a story, the story of I Pencil. Now this is actually an abridged version told in the third person. Uh, this is a tale told originally by Leonard Reed from the Foundation for Economic Education in 1958. And this is simply about your common household pencil. Pick it up and look it over. What do you see? Not much meets the eye. There's some wood, some lacquer, the printed labeling, graphite lead, a bit of metal, and an eraser. While the pencil is such a simple thing, I claim to you today that no one in this class can make one. In fact, not one person in the whole world can make one. You're skeptical? Let me try to prove it to you. The pencil begins with a tree, a cedar of straight grain that grows in Northern California and Oregon. Now contemplate all the saws and the trucks and the rope and the countless other gear used in harvesting and carting the cedar logs to the railroad siding. Think of all the persons and the numberless skills that went into their fabrication. The mining of ore, the making of steel and its refinement, into saws, axes, motors, the growing of hemp and bringing it through all the stages to heavy and strong rope, the logging camps with their beds, mess halls, the cookery, and the, ra the raising of all the foods, why untold thousands of persons had a hand in every cup of coffee the loggers drank. The logs are shipped to a mill in San Leandro, California. Can you imagine the individuals who make flat cars and rails and railroad engines and who construct and install the communication systems incidental there too? These legions are all um, a part in making a pencil. Consider the mill work in San Leandro. The cedar logs are cut into small pencil length slats less than one fourth of an inch in thickness. These are kiln dried and then Tinted for the same reason women put rouge on their faces. People prefer that I look pretty, says the pencil, not a pallid white. These slats are waxed and kiln dried again. How many skills went into the making of the tint and the kilns, into supplying the heat, the light, and the power, the belts, the motors, and all the other things a mill requires? Sweepers in the mill had a part in making this pencil. Yes, indeed they did. And included are the men who poured the concrete for the dam of Pacific Gas and Electric Company, hydro plant which supplies the mill's power. Don't overlook the people present and distant who have had a hand in transporting 60 carloads of slats across the nation. Once in the pencil factory, there's $4 million worth of machinery and equipment. The lead itself, well actually it contains no lead at all, is complex. The graphite is mined in Ceylon. The graphite is mixed with clay from Mississippi in which ammonium hydroxide is used in the refining process. The cedar receives six coats of lacquer. Do you know all the ingredients of lacquer? I don't. Observe the labeling. That's a film formed by applying heat to carbon black mixed with resins. How do you make resins and what is carbon black? My bit of metal, says the pencil, the ferrule is brass. Think of all the persons who mine zinc and copper and those who have the skills to make shiny sheet brass from these products of nature. Then there's the eraser. An ingredient called fat dice is what does the erasing. It's a rubber-like product made by reacting rapeseed oil from the Dutch East Indies with sulfur chloride. Does anyone wish to challenge my earlier assertion that no single person on the face of the earth knows how to make a pencil? Actually, millions of human beings have had a hand in its creation. Most of these people don't even know each other. There isn't a single person in all of these millions, including the president of the pencil company, who contributes more than a tiny infinitesimal bit of know-how. Neither the miner nor the logger can be dispensed with. Each one wants a pencil less than a child in the first grade. Indeed, there are some among this vast multitude who never saw a pencil, nor would they know how to use one. They are not even making the pencil for themselves. There is a fact still more astounding, the absence of a mastermind of anyone dictating or forcibly directing these countless actions which bring it into being. No trace of such a person can be found. Instead we find 
the invisible hand at work. If you can become aware of the miraculousness which the pencil symbolizes, you can help save the freedom mankind is so happily, unhappily losing. For if you are aware that these know-hows will naturally, yes, automatically arrange themselves into creative and productive patterns in response to human necessity and demand in the absence of governmental or any other coercial mastermind, then one will possess an absolutely essential ingredient for freedom, a faith in free people. Freedom is impossible without this faith. Everything we see in this room, everything from the most basic plastic cup to this complicated computer to this television was made in the same way. Millions of people all over the world, layers upon layers of individuals, all got up in the morning in their respective countries, speaking different languages, praying to different gods, engaging in different kinds of culture, all got up and act, acted in their own self-interest to simply pay the bills, to simply put food on the table, take care of their family, and yet everything they did somehow contributed to some product somewhere else. Somehow they all got up in the morning and in order to meet their, their own self-interests, produced something or served somebody in some way Somehow it all has come together in a near miraculous way to bring us everything we see. And yet, there was not one person directing them all to get up in the morning, drink your coffee, eat your breakfast, and go to work. They all did it individually and separately without knowing most of them involved. This is economics. So what is the free market? This thing that we talk about very often, uh, the free market... It's like the other day when I was watching the kids at Daniel and Tamara Keaton's house. Um, there was numerous families over there, each with children, and I was actually the only one that was single without any children. And at some point, all the adults were in one room, and all the children were in another room, and me standing there as the single person, I said, should somebody be watching those kids? And they said, well, sure, go on there and, and go watch them. They would appreciate that. So, okay. So here I go, The Bachelor. And I walk into this room, and of course at this time, uh, they had only girls in the family, so the whole house is strewn about with pink and, and you know, flowery colors and dolls and, you know, all sorts of, uh, of womanly items uh, that, that young girls like to play with and dresses. And at some point, uh, there are kids running around and climbing up things and climbing down things, and I can't tell you that anyone was or was not hanging from anything, but I walk into this thing and I think, okay, here we go. And at some point uh, in this little, this little society there, uh, Lydia, one of uh, Daniel's girls, tried to take a toy from Elijah, one of the other boys. And Elijah's just standing there minding his, his own business. He's found something in all this, all this mess of girly toys, and he just likes this thing. And Lydia walks up to him and takes it from him. And of course we know what happened. Elijah pitched a fit. So I saw this. I said, this is an opportunity. I said, this is my opportunity to influence these very, very young people in free market economics. So there I was in this room with pink and clothes strewn about and children running around and possibly swinging off of things and, and jumping. And I said, Lydia, I said, you can't just take that toy from him. I said, if you want that toy from him, you have to find something else that he wants more than that toy and offer it to him as a trade. She says, aha. And the light went off in her brain and she went running around that room full of pink and dolls and everything else that girls like to play and she'd pick one thing up and she'd run over to Elijah and say, this? And he'd say, no, I wasn't going to do it. So she'd run around somewhere else and she'd pick up some other toy and she'd bring it to him and he'd say, no, that's not it. She did this a few times until finally she found something that Elijah wanted more than the toy he had in his hand. At that moment, the free market occurred in all its bliss, in all its glory and beauty, and they exchanged products. And that is the free market. Now, there are some rules exemplified by this scenario that I've outlined. At least three rules of the free market. Number one, and the most important, you can't take other people's things without their permission. In that moment, 
Lydia was violating the most basic law of the free market. And that is you can't just take someone else's things without their permission. We call this private property rights when we're talking about economics and government. Private property rights. The idea that it is mine and it is not yours. The second rule is you have to offer someone something they want more than what they've got. That's the market. That's buying and selling. That's how you get the thing away from the other person that you want is you have to offer them something they want more than what they've got. We engage in this every single day when we go and we buy gas, when we go and we get coffee, when we go and buy groceries and food or anything else. We decide we want the money in our pocket a little bit less than we want the gas that gets put into our car. We say, I don't want to pay this much, I'd rather keep it in my pocket, but I want that full tank of gas more than I want the 60 bucks it takes to put it in my vehicle. And we do this with everything. In a free market society, you don't make an exchange unless you think you're better off afterwards. Even if you do it begrudgingly because you wish you, wish you didn't have to, in your mind you're thinking, I'm better off with that thing than the thing I'm giving up to get it. And this is the marketplace. The third and other most important rule of the free market is the government ensures this process by protecting private property rights. Now, uh, in a truly free market in the most pure sense, a free market is an economic system where the only role of the government is to protect private property rights. Now, I'm not talking about should the government have a military. I'm not talking about should the government make roads. I'm talking about the government's role in economics, what should it be. And in a true free market economy, the government simply plays the role that I played in that little room with all those kids running around. I said, no, Lydia, you can't take that from him without his permission. In a true free market system, that is the only role for the government. They're the impartial referee who calls fouls. They're not the referee who takes the ball and makes shots for the other team. If that happened in an enemy sporting event, if the referee got up and started grabbing the ball and running towards the goal and started tripping the other players and, and calling fouls only on one side, we would all say, that's not fair. Well, that's the same role that the government is supposed to play in a free market system is be the impartial referee, make sure that people don't take other people's things without their permission, and that's it. In order to further understand economics, you have to understand something called productivity. Now, if you Google the phrase productivity, if you look at an economics book and you try and find productivity, you will soon be confused and you'll soon wish you hadn't. They'll tell you about units and proportions and ratios and all that. Now, in this class, I'm trying to take those definitions and boil them down to your most basic form, not so that we can one day become economics doctor students, doctorates and PhDs, but so that we can be great citizens. So I'm going to break these down into the atom definitions which will allow us to vote and to serve as best we can in society. Productivity. Productivity is like this wonderful looking pizza on the screen. The economy is like a pizza and when you bake more pizza you add to the economy. You eat some pizza, you make some pizza. We enjoy the economy, we add to the economy. Productivity is adding something to the economy. It's adding something to the world that was not there before. Or it could be improving on something that already exists. Productivity is, in general uh, terms, making the world a better place. This can be done in the market or in life in general. Productivity creates wealth. In a market, you offer a product for someone else to buy. This can be a good or a service. A good is something that you can touch and see. A service is something that after it is performed, something is different. You can't necessarily take that aspect which has changed away and you can't put it in your pocket and walk away with that thing, but you know it's, it's been performed. It's, your car has been washed. Your house has been cleaned. When someone buys your product, you get the money, which is a form of wealth. The person who bought the product from you gained a different kind of wealth. Both people have benefited from the transaction. 
the economy grows. This is productivity. Now this is actually a very important point to make uh, because some individuals think that the pie, the pizza pie, is a fixed pie. They think that if someone has a lot of pizza, well then that's taking it from someone else. You may have heard politicians saying, that rich person over there, he took your money. Or, or that's the sense, isn't it? When, they, when the politicians put, uh, when they pit one group of people against another, that's what they're doing. They're referencing a fixed economy where that's all the wealth there is. So if someone else has a lot of it, they must have taken it from someone who doesn't. But that is a fixed pie way of thinking about it. And that is an incorrect way of thinking about the economy. The economy is not fixed. In other words, every morning when someone gets up and goes to work and they produce something, they add to the economy. When someone uh, does not add anything, well, they're not adding. Uh, but essentially, that economy can grow and it can shrink based on productivity. So it's very important that we understand that the economy is not fixed, but it is flexible and it grows and it can shrink. Very important to understand. So what is wealth? Wealth is owning anything of value or something that can be traded for something of value. Your money is paper. You can maybe use it to, to put some wallpaper up on your, on your walls, but you can't do much with it. It is simply a symbol of value and it can be traded for something that you can do something with. This is another thing that is very important to understand. The government is unproductive. The government is not bad. It is simply unproductive in the economy. This is another very important aspect to understand. A lot of politicians, they will claim they're going to create jobs. We're going to lay down some, some asphalt. We're going we're gonna to dig some ditches. We're going to put people to work. But if it's a government job, that is economically unproductive, and we're going to find out why. The government is not bad. It's simply unproductive in the economy. In other words, it does not produce anything that adds to the economy. What does that mean? Why is that? Because some people eat the pizza, but they don't bake any pizza. These people are economically unproductive. The government eats pizza, but doesn't bake any pizza. How is this possible? Because of taxes. The only way a government can operate is with our tax money. Taxes are taken from economically productive people when you go to work and you pay an income tax. Or when your business, when you, uh, when you produce something, you make some money, you pay, you pay a corporate income tax rate. When you own something, when you buy something, when you sell something, you, uh, there is a tax taken out of that. So you've got someone being economically productive and the government says, I need some of that to function. So the government is a third party actor who doesn't make any pizza. All they do is they take pizza. They do things, they're useful sometimes, but the point is, is that it is not adding something overall to the economy. It is taking from something that was already made and using it over here. And that's why the government is by definition not an economically productive entity because it must use taxes to operate. And taxes are taken from economically productive people. In other words, no more pizza was added. Taxes are essential to running a government. Since, since taxes take wealth away from the economy, taxes should be administered very carefully. A country should keep its taxes under control. This is what economics is all about. It's free people buying and selling goods and services to make each other's lives better. The question is, how much taxes should be taken away from them in order to run the government? This begs the question, how big should the government be? What should the government do? As the government gets bigger, it needs more money to pay for it. It needs more taxes. More taxes means less money people have to spend in their own lives. It also means everyone is less free because when you have less money, you have less freedom to make choices. So the summary of economics is people are productive. Government protects private property rights and takes taxes. 
This is what we will talk about in our God and Country class, how we can have the best economy possible, how we can have the best government possible, and how we can be as free as possible. Now I'd like to open it up for discussion or, or any questions we might have about what I just uh, described. I'll just make a comment. I never had really thought about the government being unproductive. I mean, they do a lot of good, obviously, to right. protect our borders as they should and um, keep us safe, but I never really thought about that they really don't add anything. Right. They're not making something for us. Right. And, and like I say, this is not a an anarchy class. This is not a class for no government. It's simply pointing out that the government as an entity takes taxes to operate. Um, and this is very important to understand because a lot of people, a lot of politicians, will they'll try and boost the economy with a stimulus. So we remember these words from early on in this current administration. We're going to have a trillion dollar stimulus package. Well, that was a trillion dollars taken out of a productive economy run through the government mill, so to speak, and then dispersed and... Redistributed. It was redistribu redistributed, exactly. Now, the funny thing about government is that you need agencies, you need bureaucrats, you need uh, office buildings, you need all these things for every function that they perform. So, a trillion dollars taken out of stimulus money, taken out of the economy, means, well, let's just say about you know, 600 billion went to administrative needs. We went to buildings and to paying people's salaries and paying their pensions and all this stuff. And Well, maybe you had a little bit left over to actually make it to the destination, but that's a trillion dollars that could have been spent purely on productive means or let's just say 400 billion that finally actually got to a destination. So by definition, uh, a government is economically unproductive and it spends your money in a less effective way if you just would have used it on your own. Yeah. They expanded the government in the process. That's right. And therefore they have a continuing expense that they previously didn't have before. That's right. So now they have to sustain that. That's right. They have to sustain the department they created and, and the that's right, the bureaucrats they hired, etc. And so this is very important whenever uh, a politician says that they're going to boost the economy by creating jobs. Well, one thing to realize is a job is not the end, it's not the goal of a productive society. In other words, we could have 100% full employment sponsored by the government if they gave everyone a shovel and said, now you dig this ditch and then took the person next to them and said, now you fill in that ditch. So we could have 100% full employment with we're all working, but that's not productive. In other words, unless there is a universal need to have ditches digging and then filled back in, that's, that's not a productive enterprise. So whenever a politician says we're going to create jobs and boost the economy, if they're talking about government jobs, that means they had to take it first from an economically productive enterprise and put it to work in a non-productive means. So we have to be very, very careful whenever we hear them talk about creating jobs. It's not jobs that we want, it's economically productive jobs that we want. I think it's also important to understand the idea that, like I said earlier, that uh, productivity, that wealth is not a fixed pie scenario because this is how the, the politicians uh, pit people against each other. You know, that's whenever you hear someone talk about those Wall Street fat cats, that's meant to get someone with not a lot of money upset at someone with a lot of money. And the only reason that someone would get upset at someone with a lot of money is if they thought somehow that they are unjustly taking it from them, you see. Because someone who understands it's not a fixed pie, but it's a movable pie that productivity will add to the economy, they understand that rich person might just give me a job. And together, we'll both add to the economy. In a fixed pie scenario, people think that if you win, I must have lost. That's the way they think of the economy. So if you're rich, I lost in that scenario, and that's why I'm poor. So true free market economics is not a win-lose proposition. It's a win-win. Because the only way you let go of anything you have in a free market economy is if you wanted that other thing better. So if you are letting go of a product, it's because you wanted the money more than the product. And if you're letting go of your money, it's because you wanted the product more than the money, so you both win.
So it's very important to understand in a free market economy, it's not a win-lose scenario, it's a win-win scenario. But the fixed deposit analysis supports the whole redistribution of wealth. That's right, it does. And that line of philosophy. That's right. So, you know, well, gee, it's fixed, therefore, the only way to get you more money is for me to take it from somebody that's got more wealth. That's right, that's right. So, it's, it's kind of like... And, and so people believe that lie. You know, it's really yeah. a lie. People don't understand. That's right. That that it's not a fixed. That's right. If we don't get these foundational principles, well, then we can be led astray in so many different ways. In other words, if if we don't understand that true productivity adds, and if we don't understand the government is unproductive ec economically, well, then we can be fooled. If we think it's a fixed pie, we can be fooled. So, these basic uh, principles of economics are really the foundation. If you think about uh, private property rights, well, um, the idea that you can't take things from someone else, well, uh, what does that sound like? Where does that sound like it comes from? <clears throat> you can't take someone else's things without their permission. From the Bible. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Ten Commandments. Yeah. That's right. So, if you think about uh, the, the ISIS army, those, um, you know, the is Islamic militants marching across Iraq, well, most everything they get, they get by taking it, mm -hmm. by force. Um, so really, the free market system of, I have to offer you something you want more in order to get what you have, that is a Christian market. And not every, not every place in the world operates upon these principles. In other places, it's, if I'm stronger, I get your things. That's whether it be a dictatorship, or whether it be a monarchy, or whether it be just a brutal regime like ISIS, if I'm stronger than you, if I have overwhelming force, I take your things. And I don't give you anything in return other than possibly sparing your life, or maybe I take that too. So it's important to point out that uh, the free market system is not only biblically compatible, but it is biblically influenced. And that not every society in the world operates according to these principles.